when Dan when Dan when Dan reads in town, you have to get uh, liquored up. Just because yeah, of absolute bullshit. Yeah, right? yeah, early doors, eh? Getting to the field. <laughs> Episode five, though, folks, the Silly Goose uh, podcast, Silly Goose Gang podcast, and we have our professor Dan rejoining us all the way from is Taiwan. You're in just now, Dan. Taiwan at the moment, yeah. Uh, before before we get started, we have to discuss uh, a couple of things. Uh, we didn't speak about a fee. How, how much is this? How much am I getting paid for this? What is the? Uh... I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'll check you. Okay. Uh, so I'm assuming there's no financial incentive for me to be here, right? No, no, hundred percent. Okay. All right. Um, so Ali, I expect to be paid with a tribute song, Backstreet <laughs> okay. Boys. I want at least at least a verse. At least a verse. I can do what, that. Yeah. What okay. song? I, I know. I, I don't know any of their songs. I only know them once Ali starts singing them. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm ready when you are. Okay. Tell me why is definitely my best option. Okay. Go on. Go on. Even, even with even with incredible pressure on the chest, I still did a not bad effort. It might have helped. Yeah. I'm. I'm just gonna go for it. Yeah. You know. I, I have. I have been called the songbird of my generation. You have to be aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> Like a yeah. Ain't nothing but a heartache. Tell me why. Ain't nothing but a mistake. Tell me why. I never want to hear you say. Come on, Chris, join in other words. What? Oh, yeah. Okay, that's payment enough, I suppose. Are you, <laughs> are you, um, are you hard just now? Uh, the, the camera's <laughs> cut off at this angle for a reason, right? <laughs> mm. So how have you been anyway, Dan? It's been a while. I'm all right. I mean, I think everyone's in a kind of weird spot. Hey? And I, like, for me, this has been gone for, feels like a lot longer because I was in China when it first kicked off. So um, for me, it seems like it's never ending. I, yeah. I stopped working in China on January 15th. Stayed there another month, basically stuck in the house. So it feels like my quarantine started January fifteenth. <laughs> yeah. That's it, man. How close were you to all like the the kind of ground zero of, of Wuhan? How close were you to all that when you were in China? Pretty far away. Like uh, I, Wuhan's all the way on the uh, east coast. I'm pretty much all the way in the west. Um, okay. So pretty far away. By the time I left, there was like I don't know maybe two or three hundred cases in my city, which Seemed like a lot back then, not compared to what the UK and the States are doing now, but the numbers yeah. at the time, that was getting a bit hairy, and I hadn't worked for like a month and getting bored, so I thought, get the fuck out of China and just uh, try and get ahead of it a bit. Uh, definitely. Now so did you go to- open and back to normal, so <laughs> I ran away from it, but it's kind of came full circle, and I can't get back now with the borders being closed. I've, um, I keep getting updates here on, on my phone from Instagram, because I put up saying to a few of the guys who are going to beat to Dan and they all want to know we probably should have uh, done this one live on Instagram actually or Facebook live because they would like to watch it but it doesn't matter we just, just put it away you can only blame the tech guy are you the tech guy Chris? am I the tech guy? that's what I'm thinking it doesn't seem like you should be you know, I'm drinking beer at 10 o'clock in the morning <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> but, Ali's, uh, the, Ali's the brains behind this operation that adds up Everyone's got their niche that they can work in. Everyone's definitely got the niche. So did you go straight from China back into Taiwan then, Dan, or did you go? Did you I would have, the but the, the, uh, the borders were closed for anyone coming from China going to Taiwan. So I had to find countries that allowed people from China to come to the country. So uh, Thailand allowed at the time. So ended up in Thailand for like a few days, then to Bangladesh for a week, then mm. back to Thailand, then eventually to Taiwan. So it's kind of a long way for a shortcut, but uh, you had to spend two weeks out of the country. So. And you were rolling, who did you, who was, I forget the name, sorry, I'm terrible with names. Who were you rolling in Bangladesh again? In Bangladesh, I've just got a couple of students out in Bangladesh. Uh, so he's kind of, a, he has like a, uh, a gym built in his in his house, and uh, there's a few other small kind of things coming up. It's, it's very new there. It's you know mostly lower level guys, but uh, yeah, there's a, quite a few people training there. But like, I, I probably went there once every year for the last three or four years. So it's, it, it's developing it, more. It's not going, who is it you rolled with? You rolled with in Thailand. Like, there's there's a good guy in Thailand, probably the best guy in Asia, uh, DJ Jackson, uh, one of the guys. Uh, 
yeah. he's obviously world class. One of the kind of few guys that are world class in Asia and also around my weight. We'd be around the same weight. So, um, yeah, pretty pretty cool to roll with someone world class who's also my weight and, and competes a lot. That's cool. Yeah. All right. That brings us, Dylan's actually asked a question in the background, Dan. Dylan from Goliath saying, on your travels, have you picked up any new techniques, any new little tricks to add to your repertoire, anything you've been working on? Uh, there's things that happen with, like, so when I was rolling with, with DJ, I got to get some of my things pressure tested by, like, a very high-level guy. So, like, I got to see the things that I've been kind of working on for a while. I got to see how they fit in against a very good guy. And if there was um, any small tweaks that were necessary, but most of it was just kind of thinking, oh, cool, that thing I've been working on, like, it works against against high-level guys. It has, it's still effective against the, the, the best guys. So, um that was the main takeaway, thinking certain things that I'm working on, I'm definitely heading in the right direction with them. Cool. So like the, the, te the techniques, if you like, it'd be like a small part thinking, oh, maybe this, maybe my elbow has to be here rather than here on, on this technique, if you like. So not a whole thing, more like just small adjustments against kind of uh, more high level guys. Hmm. That's cool. What, um, what, 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 have you, what, what have you found in, with working? Like what, what, uh, in particular, is there anything? I, I'm probably the worst guy ever about speaking about jujitsu techniques. Like I have to like start showing things. I have to grab my girlfriend at the, at the bathroom and have her show. But like, um, <laughs> so using like like the pre shoulder, like the, doing it on the bottom side, I found that doing it on the top side from half guard and and, uh, and even when someone passes allows me to like an anti cross face. So I'm cross facing myself back. This has kind of changed my ability to play. Um, play my guards without fear of someone being able to uh, flatten me out if they are able to pass. You're, so played, you're, playing, you're playing half guard with Preet's shoulder? With, with, with top shoulder, yeah. So yeah. The, the, the boxing shoulder on the top. Um, it's, it's been a, that, that's been a huge change in, in the way I play half guard. But to be honest with you, like my half guard has been garbage for years. Like, terrible. Like, I'm very long and like, the cross face is always there, guillotines. I felt like my half, that's why I played so much Z guard, which is kind of like a hybrid half guard, I suppose. But since two knees are in front, I think it's probably considered a full guard in my mind. But you'd very rarely see me in half guard unless it was a mistake uh, because I just get cross faced and flattened too easily. So that top shoulder has allowed me to kind of have very little fear of getting flattened out. Hmm, interesting. I like how you also yeah, said that's been when you saying you're tall when kind of rangy that half guard doesn't work great for you. It makes me feel better about how shit my half guard is now because I'm kind of <laughs> rangy as well. So if you're struggling with it, that gives me the answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I used to, like, I teach it and some of my guys were able to pick it up, but honestly, like, I wasn't able to do it against high-level guys. Like, you know, it's traditional under kind of cross-face type situation in half guard. Like, against guys close to my level or even below my level, I don't want to be there at all. So I'd try and Z-guard my way back out or get a half butterfly or do something like to keep them off me, but the the top shoulders really helped. Well, if you if if, if, uh, if not if you're not good at it, sorry for us, you're not good at it. Not you, Chris. You're like a fucking ball. It's perfect for you. <laughs> you can never put a ball on its back, can you? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a side. You're just like a fucking circle. Thank you. Such so. a compliment from somebody so long. <laughs> Have you uh, seen the new Goliath gym? You've been keeping up with that on Insta at all, Dan? Yeah, I, I, I see. Uh, I've seen a bunch of a bunch of uh, Stephen's uh, stories and stuff like that. Looks fucking massive, eh? Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's absolutely. Uh, how long did you guys get in the gym before everything shut down? Yeah, I've one never been. Yeah, oh, one man. session and one session. we literally moved kind of the the of the lockdown starting in the UK, and um, so I think. As you say, I think maybe one or two classes went ahead the week of the lockdown, um, and I was I was out the, the week it was opening up with whatever I had at the time. Um, I, think back know, back. I think we know what you had. Right. You were patient zero in the UK. Entirely possible. Entirely probable. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> the gym's looking the gym's looking tremendous. Eh? Um, I got a few for Harris at a time like this. You know, like I mean, for me, it's easy to focus on me, and I'm like, man, like. I feel like I'm getting shot on here, you know what I mean? Like, I went to China, a great job, I'll oh, fuck now, it's over. But it's, so, it's easy to think I've got it bad here, but then you see other people, especially my friends, the gyms, and I'm like, fuck. 
that is yeah. that's a disaster, you know. Like in Hannah, it's about the worst situation. Just got a new big place, probably invested a lot of time and money into it, and then fuck straight away. I can't make money from it. So um, yeah, I think when I see that, I think maybe <laughs> there's some people have been a bit more unlucky than I have been. But then the good thing is, is once it's over, I don't know how it's going to be uh, another month, two months, whatever it is. But once it's over, everybody's going to want to trade. Like it will. <laughs> yeah, this will be like the um, you know after like the new year, right? After yeah. New Year, everyone's back, back with a vengeance. And that's like, you've only been off for a couple of days. But yeah, I think after this, people are really going to make, uh, I mean, end the quarantine uh, goals, right? Yeah, like yeah. New Year's resolutions, end the quarantine resolutions. <laughs> Everybody's going to train, it's going to be good fun. Yeah, the gym looks cool. I, I know you just put some videos up of, um, look, he's got a, a cage wall up against the mat now, and there's a, a lifting area. Um, looks really, really cool, so... Were you hiding a burp as you were speaking? That you were burping while speaking, eh? Yeah. No problem. This is, this is first. You're two minutes late. Now you're burping while talking to me. This is the most unprofessional thing I've ever been a part of. Well, it's called the Silly Goose Gang. Okay. That that, that, that doesn't mean you burp when you talk. Well, you didn't hide that from anybody. Do you, do you fart when you walk? Uh, not intentionally. <laughs> well, it's like, it's like that, <laughs> that was intentional. You could have stopped, excused yourself. Yeah, I would excuse myself if it was something good on, but it's you, so it's just, <laughs> it. you have to get more than five years to attract someone good. Five <laughs> years, you get this kind of level. <laughs> I think the good thing though, talking, you know, you were saying there, Dan, about with uh, Harris just opening up almost as it shut down. I think it's been from what Harris has been saying that the. Pretty much everyone from Goliath is on the whole kept up their membership fees, so mm-hmm. you know he's able to cover his rent, keep it going, which I think is testament to you know the the group of people that we have at Goliath. That everyone's still willing to chip in even when we can't train. Yeah, people are still paying their subs, which I think has made a massive difference. I think if that wasn't the case, um, and if it was part of like a big, you know, like a global gym f- franchise or something, I think it'd be a very different situation. But it's yeah, kind of yeah, right. you know what I mean. I don't think there's many gyms. Uh, in the UK or, or, or anywhere, jiu-jitsu gyms, they can survive two or three months with no no incoming. I don't think there's... It's possible. Like, yeah. you, you just don't have that kind of... like You should have some savings, but like to cover yourself for three months with no income, you'd have to... It's sort of unprecedented times, right? No one's... We haven't been... This, I mean, we haven't been in a situation. Our parents weren't in a situation. Like, you know, it's, it's something very weird. So, yeah, it's pretty cool that the, the jiu-jitsu community and, and, and gyms are small enough that they kind of, like, support... You know, still supporting with uh, with all the shit that's going on. How's um, how's your how's your gym or your former gym in uh, Taiwan? Well, the, the Taiwan, there's no lockdown, so people are still training. Still training is normal. Yeah, that's well, right. I mean, the, I think people are worried about it. The numbers will certainly be going down, um, but not like, people are still training. So, that's well, right. I think one of the only countries in the world that I reckon they're still training. So, yeah. well, I think at this the, the moment there's still only about 300 cases in Taiwan and. Um, when it first came out, Taiwan was like number one high risk because there's so much trade and, and a movement appeal between China. Uh, but yeah. they locked China very early, started like quarantining very early, so well, only three, three hundred. What's actually the deal with like, China and Taiwan? Is it is Taiwan a separate country or is that a disputed thing? Uh, I wouldn't be able to comment on that. Um, since I lived in Taiwan for so long and I'll be going back to China, um, we'll just say. Not what I think. What they, what both these groups of people think. The ta- Taiwanese in general believe that Taiwan is a sovereign country. Chinese believe it's part of China. Oh, okay, and that's that. What I believe is irrelevant. China might be listening, so. Um, <laughs> China definitely. What's that? China definitely. Yeah, so I, I believe whatever China wants me to believe. <laughs> All hail the great you, ruler. Are you going to head back to China at some point, or? Yeah, as soon as the border opens, um, the border's closed to foreign nationals at the moment. So, um, yeah, I'm just kind of waiting in limbo for the borders to open. Okay. Cool. Why, why are you not coming back to Scotland in the meantime? Uh, the price of the flights is fucking outrageous, and you guys can't even train, so, like, I wouldn't be able to make any money while I'm back anyway. Well, you can just hand so, like, I'd, I'd be spending a fortune to come back home and be able to recoup no money when I get there, so... Yeah. When... Um... Are you, are you planning on coming back once you get the, the chance at some point this year? I mean, is the world ever going to open again? Is it, it going to be a Scotland yeah. left by the time I want to come back? <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't, whether, well, yeah. I don't, like, because we're supposed to be going to, 
we were supposed to be going to the, the Iceland camp, uh, the Globetrotters camp in Iceland, and they're hanging off for that, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Like, I know um, a few of the guys in the, the the Facebook group were saying that the flights from Canada have been cancelled already mm-hmm. for July, so I don't know if that camp's going to happen. But, um, yeah, it seems unlikely. Like, so I know Christian had said on, on the group that they were waiting as long as possible, but like if people can't get there, I don't know if they have much of a choice. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think it'd be very unlikely that it goes ahead. Um, so I don't and, yeah, just the traveling at the moment is like expensive and a, and a nightmare. So yeah, yeah. I had uh, I had friends that were in um, traveling in Chile, um, and they had to fly back, and they spent an absolute fortune on the flight to get back. But they were like, "Well, what's the alternative? Like, sit and hope that eventually there's a repatriation flight that might happen in X amount of time, or." It seems yeah. unlikely from the UK. They were the last to pull the trigger on the Chinese. Yeah, absolutely. And and it cost them a fortune, and it didn't get them to the the their in very commas home airport. But at least it was back into the UK, so that mm. once you get into the UK, you know you can get buses, taxis, friends, family. Yeah, right, yeah. They said it was like the the cost was astronomical compared to what they they paid to get out there in the first place. Yeah. Um, so now I totally take that on board. Yeah, it's just. As you say, the, the buzzword at the moment is unprecedented. It's pretty much all we hear on the news these days. Um, yeah, I mean, I you think, can't prepare for something. You don't know when it's going to end, right? Like, yeah. there's, like there's, <laughs> and people don't know, so what can you do, right? There's no one can give you an answer because we just don't know. So it's, yeah, the only thing that makes, and this is, this is a kind of shitty thing to say, but like when I was kind of going through all this shit, I was like, man, I can't even really complain to anyone because they have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. And now the whole world is going through the same shit. I'm like, oh, we're all kind of in the same boat now. Like it's shit yeah. for everybody, so it's, it's somewhat fair, I suppose. Yeah, I know. Um, well, one of the things that's quite cool is I know that all the stuff that I was meant to be doing this year is going to be cancelled, but I'm kind of hoping that there's, a, there's an ADCC in Manchester usually in December, so hopefully that's far enough away that that's still something that's um possible. So, yeah. as soon as the gym gets open, whether it's another two months or, or whatever, we can just like I was saying, a few of the guys, Lee Emsley and stuff. Maybe just get like a load of us and go down to Manchester and compete at the end of the year would be super cool. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be a good competition because I think everybody by that point, um, you know, saying that to Moth as well, like that I think everybody wants to compete. So as soon as it's competition, <laughs> I, I, I think in everyone's head they think, oh, I want to compete, I want to compete. And you're going to go back to the gym after not training for two months and think, holy fucking shit, I can't do five minutes of that. <laughs> so I think people's minds will want to compete, but maybe their bodies might take a month or two to get ready. Yeah. Yeah, we were we were kind of half joking that we're all going to be back to white belt. We're gonna to have to re we're gonna to have to regrade and get rebelt whipped before we go back in the gym. Oh, I like that idea. Maybe the whole combat is calling Chris. Terrible idea. Terrible idea. It's funny yeah. though. Like I um, so I was quarantined or not quarantined, but no training in China for like three weeks or four weeks. Um, then went to Thailand and stuff and felt like oh, actually all my skills have stayed the same, but I have like a kind of like a hunger for it more mm-hmm. so like I've, I've been training less even now i can train in taiwan but i've been training a lot less and my skills seem to be like almost getting better like because when i go back i'm really keen to be there it's really like i'm not really coaching i'm just i'm just training for the most part and it's kind of fun to not coach and just not think of any of that shit and yeah. just train just do whatever i want inspiring it's really fun so <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's weird do you ever get so like, so when you're not training? So just like this, uh, this I'm thinking about this because it came to me the other day when I was I was out running, and I was just thinking about an armbar position, and I thought about something to do with my feet while I was running. So you, do you still get ideas in your head when you're not training? Yeah. And yeah. You go, I wonder if this would work. I, I often get them when I'm uh, when I'm falling asleep. So uh, I, th- I think this some comedian made this joke, but this is how I feel about um, jujitsu. I have this great idea like an amazing idea for jujitsu just as i'm about to fall asleep so i have to kind of convince myself either it really is an amazing idea because it might be shit right i'm half asleep or just say to myself fuck it it wasn't a good idea and go to sleep so i'm always in this balance of should i get up write it down or should i just go to sleep so i think i've probably lost 50 percent of my good ideas deciding they were a bad idea to get to sleep (laughs) (laughs) um yeah, no, it's just one of those things that sometimes, sometimes the weirdest things got up. Generally, I'll ask you, send you a message and say, what can I do with this? And then you would just say, video it, and then I'll have to get somebody to video it. Usually, yeah, with, with words, I always, if someone's describing a move, I'm kind of looking at it, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, it's yeah. very hard for me to put those words I, into a picture. I, I usually don't know what I'm talking about. 
as me and Ali worked out with the Chris and the Auntie Chris, we figured out the same same night. Yes. <laughs> Figured out, figured out how to do something and Ali figured out how to stop it like that and then we just completely pointless but you can only try. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Antichrist is good actually. It sounds a bit like what you really are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the great. Antichrist. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was, I, I thought you were going to go a completely good. different route with that there but uh, I'll take the Antichrist. Yeah. That works. No, I like that, yeah. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Like good yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe you guys are the same. I think a lot of people are but so... On, I spend so much fucking time on YouTube during this. I'm not quarantined, but like people are definitely in the house more so. I'm in the house a lot watching YouTube, and I'm just like finding new things. I'm like, I've been watching a shit ton of arm wrestling. But like, <laughs> I must have watched a hundred arm wrestling videos. Um, and like I see things in, that they're doing, thinking, oh, that could work in jiu-jitsu, right? But there's some things will motivate me to think, oh, there might be some carryover between these positions. The, the, the human body only moves certain ways, right? We've some ways strong and some ways weak. So arm wrestling is a very, very small window into, uh, into a movement. And um, I think you can pick up some things from, from stupid things that are unrelated to jiu-jitsu. You can see parallels and, and, and make some connections with it. What would be, in, in arm wrestling, what would be the position? Are you talking about like finger positions? The way you've wrapped uh, the finger around them? When you've watched as much arm wrestling as me now, I consider myself an arm, armchair expert. <laughs> um, so like they have like, they would have the top roll and then it have the cup, right? The cup is like my Kimura or my uh, or my Americana. They're using this, um, you know, the, the Gangnam shape. Yeah, yeah. So they're doing that in arm wrestling, but they have also a, a, an over an over roll, which might be applicable somewhere in Jiu Jitsu too. The, uh, they call it arm wrestling, but it's kind of like a hand fight, right? They're, they're, they're maneuvering the hand in all sorts of different ways. And for any kind of Kimura or armbar type stuff, there'd be some sort of a, applicable things there. So yeah. I'm thinking about retiring from jiu-jitsu and just taking up arm wrestling. Taking up arm wrestling, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would work. No, probably not. Yeah. If nothing, every, time, every yeah. time I've arm wrestled in my life, I've been injured. <laughs> <laughs> you can always go back and watch Sly Stallone in that great 80s movie, Over the Top. Just remember yeah. that. Yeah, I do, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the best arm wrestler of all time is in that. John Brisnick is in that movie. You actually know the best arm wrestler of all time. You've went deep. Mate, I, 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 I've probably spent minimum 10 hours watching arm wrestling stuff over the last two months. Answer this honestly. Are you naked when you're watching it? I, ha- I mean, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's YouTube. It's going to jump just watching YouTube. It's, really, it's fine to be naked watching YouTube. Just watching guys fighting naked. It, in, in, in another one, it's climbing. I watch a shit ton of climbing videos. Um, this, this, is what, this is what the quarantine's got me into, arm wrestling and climbing. I like climbing, but I don't want to do it. I'm too scared. That makes sense. Yeah. What, um, do you want to ask you, 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 you when you were getting, uh, where were you? You were training with, with Preet and got your... Uh, Ali, can you translate that for me? <laughs> translate that. I don't know what the fuck he said. I so said, you, Preet. you were training with Preet and got your uh, first degree. Yeah, I mean, that kind of thing is just like... Um, I mean, basically, you're a first degree after you've after you've been a black belt for three years. So, like, you can just kind of like put a stripe on your belt if you like. But I felt like Preet's been a good influence on me over the last two or three years. I feel like uh, certain things that he's doing in coaching is like uh, influenced my game in the last couple of years. So I asked him if I could, uh, if he could be the one to give me a stripe when we're having a bottle of wine. So, and there was there was no stripe. <laughs> he didn't put a stripe on my belt. I just made him. Uh, I, I forced them into saying you'd give me one. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh filling them full of red wine. Oh, that makes sense. You're good yeah. at that. <laughs> Very good yeah. at that. Talking, so talking, about, talking about drinking, Dan, this was way before I met you for the first time at Goliath. Um, I actually got the, you know, the BJJ uh, or uh, BJJ Globetrotter uh, book that first came out, mm-hmm. the student's book. And I got given that as a secret Santa present at work about three, four years ago and had read it and never made a connection until after I had met you that you were the Dan that's in the books. <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, when, you read the, when you read the stories, it makes sense. Well, what's worse than that, what's worse than that is, I was at Dan's 30th, uh, William, was it William Watson's flat in Edinburgh? I mean, um, we've been at his flat before, so it could have been my 30th. Yeah, it was just a long time ago, man. There was loads of guys there, and I didn't make the connection that the, the Danish guy was Christian. <laughs> the the, 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 the guy, 
Yeah, the, the guy called Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Just, was, was in Christian. And then my head, in my head at the time, was I was one of those guys like, man, to try to take me down and just punch him. I just punch him. I would just stand up. It, it doesn't work, does it? You just stand up. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. I mean, it doesn't work if you get hit one of those shots first. Well, that's true. I mean, <laughs> I, I reckon I'd beat you up if I got you to the ground. If you punch me first, then fuck that. I don't, I don't know if I'd want to hit you on that chin, to be honest. Aim for the nose, man. It's a fucking decent target. <laughs> The only problem is if the punch doesn't immediately put you down, then you're in trouble, Chris. It probably will, man. It probably will. Honestly. Unless I'm drunk. I feel like I've got a chance if I'm drunk. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm sober, I think I'll fall. Fucking fall yeah. in the pack of cards. But if I'm drunk, I think I'll take you. A, a black belt in drunk jitsu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've experienced that as well. Uh, yeah. And even before that, before we officially met Dan, we must have at least been, I don't know how to word this right, semi-acquainted back in the day of the outdoor basketball courts in Dunfermline, it turns out. Yeah, I mean, me and a few guys, we, we're we the people that got them put up, uh, yeah. the ones at Dunfermline High. We, we um, went around raising money and speaking to the council, and we got them put up. Um, yeah. and, and that was my life before, before Jiu-Jitsu, really 10 years of basketball, pretty much played every day. Um, so when I saw you play, I thought it was so weird. I'm like, I don't, I don't recognise this guy. But then I, I assume that you weren't bald when you were 13 years old. So no, have you never seen my my amazing flowing ginger afro? I had like oh, my, yeah. Holy shit. there's a picture. <laughs> I'll show you later because I can't get up on the phone. But if you picture Slash from Guns and Roses, but bright carrot ginger, <laughs> that is pretty much what my hair looked like for most of my teenage years. I uh, feel like I would remember that. Yeah, yeah, well, you would have thought so, eh? but like I, like I used to play with like Dave Baxter, um, who I know you know, um, mm -hmm. on the courts a lot. So there must have been definitely a point where we were on the courts at the same time and just completely unaware of the of each other, basically. Yeah. And just, yeah, especially with my big ginger afro <clears throat> at the time. Uh, I realised this recently. I've seen like um, this, this, uh, this is this is pr pretty niche. Sorry, but this Chris, this is going to be boring for a second. Sorry, everyone. Except for Ali, um, <laughs> I saw recently there's um, uh, like a Scotland basketball page, uh, uh, like through the ages, and they're all adding pictures from 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 years ago and stuff. Um, and I've been looking at all these pictures and realizing like every other team, I hated everybody. If they weren't on my team, I hated them. Uh -huh. And like the difference between basketball and jujitsu that way, like I've got friends from all the gyms I go to, right? But like in basketball, it was us versus them. If they weren't on my team, I fucking hated them. So every time a picture comes up, I fucking hate that guy, I hate that guy. And now I kind of ask myself in my head, why did I hate him? Oh, he's on the other team. Yeah, all right. That doesn't seem like a huge reason. Like, I still feel hate in my heart with these people that I played basketball against 20 years ago. And I have no reason for it, other than the fact that they were trying to beat me and I was trying to beat them. Yeah. I have to throw the ball in the whole game, you know what I mean? Like, it's <laughs> so weird. You're trying to throw a ball in the hole? That's, that's basketball, isn't it? Yes. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I thought it was a ball in the hoop, but, you know. Uh, I was just making a ball. joke, Chris. I told you, you're not in this for a second. This is, this is real sportsman talk. Oh, real sportsman talk. <laughs> I'll just... I'll just it's, 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 yeah, I think that's... I, I was talking to my boys, Aaron and Logan, um, last summer about that, because as well as basketball, I played rugby growing up. And I still The friendly is fun, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except for Dundee High, I hate Dundee High um, because the the last se one of the last seasons I played, uh, the club I played for in Dundee were basically neck and neck for the title, and we were due to play them in Dundee in the last game of the season, um, and they they pulled out the game. They didn't play us, so they ended up judging us as co champions. Um, and when you look at like results versus like the same teams. We hammered the teams by a lot more than Dundee did. And there was all the rumours at the time, you know, you're talking 1994, that's how long ago it goes, <laughs> that they were like, they didn't want to play us and they didn't and want the to play And the scandal is still going on, eh? Yeah, and that's what I'm saying, like, <laughs> a year old grown man with three kids and, like, we were in Dundee because I knew it was at a, a Glee concert and I was like, we drove past and saw the sign for Dundee High and I was like, fucking Dundee High, fucking scum, <laughs> like, shouting out the window and I don't know, we're like, Geez, Dad, it was like 30 years ago. Give it, let it go now, let it go. Uh, it's, it's weird how that happens. It's weird how it sticks in you in the psyche, and you just you can't really shake it, even as 
a logical, sensible <laughs> call as growing adult, and you're like, nah, there's just that bit in your heart and your brain that just will always hold on to that. But I reckon that's because they didn't play you. And, and I think in a way in basketball, it's kind of like you, you were, I, I mean, I took it very seriously. I was really, really trying to win all the time. Um, and like, it's just, in my mind, it's like a fight. But of course, there's zero fighting going on, right? So at the end of the, 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 end of the game, if they beat us, I still feel like, well, I could have beat, I could have beat you up. I could really win the fight. But with jiu-jitsu, it's pretty, it's clear. You know who's tougher. You can't escalate it anywhere else. So I feel like there's very little hatred in my heart for someone that beat me in jiu-jitsu. Because I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I can't escalate it. They beat me. Mm-hmm. But in basketball, I'm like, we could, we could settle this a different way. <laughs> I don't know. I think there's something too. I think that's why rugby players are usually super nice. Like very little sort of... Um, uh, no violence and stuff from rugby players off the off the field, because they get it all sorted out on the field. Because it's like it's a contact sport where football players are like notorious for that kind of shit. Yeah, I think, so. um, I think it was Dana White. Dana White that said like every sport eventually descends into fighting. So why not just get rid of the sport and just fight? Effectively, <laughs> like what the UFC is. Right. Uh, I mean, that would work in some ways. What about swimming though? I, like those fucking water polo guys, man, they beat the shit of you in the pool. Definitely, it's just the boss is not working in the pool. <laughs> no, they would. That's fine. I can take that. I can get beat up with a, a water polo guy. Yeah. Mm. I can, I can deal with that. Because you've also got the added thing, you know, you know the whole jujitsu thing of the the mats, the the pool, or the sea, and all that chat about the line being king of the land and. Jiu-Jitsu being the sharp, but if you're in the water playing water polo, you're going to end up getting drowned. No, for There's sure. No Apparently, back in the day, water polo, especially but like Carnegie had a pretty good team out here, but like there's no underwater observation tank, so you, you can't see under the under the water. So they're grabbing each other's balls and twisting them and fucking punching each other, and the referees can't see because below the water. And then at the higher level, they have like referees with an observation tank below, so they can see all these ball grabs and. And punches. <laughs> I think water polo is savage, man. Yeah. Again, our friend Dave Baxter plays that and played that for a while. I think he might still be playing. Yeah. He was a good player, eh? I, I knew a few of those guys that played basketball, actually. Yeah. They weren't very good, but they were tough. Aye, uh, well, Dave, Dave played water polo, basketball, and he was our number eight for our rugby team, eh? He was a good athlete, just generally. Mm. Shout out to Dave Baxter. Um, just a bit of an athlete back in the day, like. Not so much nowadays, I'm sure. <laughs> Did he come from a gymnastics background? He did indeed. I came from the, I think it was Spartans, Spartans gymnastics. Yeah. yeah, along with um, Craig Skinner and guys like that. Um, that we all came from that. Just a, a good general athletic base that transferred over into so many sports. I think it's a key for that one of the, uh, you know, they talk about early specialisation. Guys that play football and only play football in Scotland from the age of, you know, three. Mm-hmm. And having an ability to transfer it to other things. Whereas you look at someone like, a, you know, yourself or a, a day Baxter that played three, four, five different sports, and maybe we're yeah, never, we're you know, what I'm on two, but could could transfer it to so many different sports and pick it up and relate it to things, and yeah, it makes sense. I, I, I think gymnastics would be that one, right? If I if I'm ever unlucky enough to to be blessed with a child, um, I, I'd throw it into gymnastics for sure, like baby gymnastics, toddler gymnastics. You know, by the time it's seven or eight years old, they can go do any sport. Like, I see a lot of, like, kids' jiu-jitsu classes. They're, like, super shit gymnastics programs. They just have them tumbling and do all this stuff. They're not actually doing jiu-jitsu. They're just doing really shit gymnastics. So why not just send them to an awesome gymnastics class and have them... They'll go to that jiu-jitsu class when they're eight or nine and just smoke everyone because they're a super athlete. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it it does. It gives you such a good base gymnastics when you think of the balance, good... You know that gymnastic strain. You know, you look at you look at like Olympic level male gymnasts, and they're all absolutely stacked. You know, those guys on the rings and they're like five that. foot five. To be fair, though, what was that? They're like five foot five. To be fair, yeah, t- yeah true, but still, they're they're absolutely stacked. Do you know what I mean? They're a stacked by strength to weight ratio. They'd be like top of the world, but I mean, yeah, they're tiny, tiny wee guys. Uh, yeah, but like Chris, yeah. stacked, <laughs> but tiny, tiny wee guy. Yeah, that's me. Oh. I don't know about you, Dad. I, 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 like I don't look at the girls. I don't, I don't, I don't need to look at the guys. I look at the girls. That's because you fucking hammered me. How, how many beers have you had? Uh, one and a half. 
<laughs> Me and I were having a conversation. You're just getting fucking tanked in the corner. <laughs> That's all right. I'm, I'm fine with that. It's, it's what, what, is it 10.30 in the morning now? What was yeah, that? 10.39, it's, it's just hit. Yeah. <laughs> 40 minutes we've been putting up with his shit. 40 minutes you've been tanking fucking beers. Yeah. That's all right. It's fine. I'll work it off. Yeah. Give yeah, me some on. questions, Chris. Let's see what you've got. you got some notes or something? I don't have any notes. I don't need notes. Someone professional. Yeah, I mean, you're on quarantine. You're not even working. You could have wrote some fucking notes. I, I actually, I am working. So you're essential. I'm, wor- no, I'm working. I'm still working. If I had two beers, what are you going to do? I'm not working today. So, I'm working. Working today. so you could have taken notes. I've got garden stuff to do. I've got a lot of adult stuff to do. Uh, the, the, this, this podcast is not going to make it the big time now. You've got to drop that guy to your side. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to drop him. Okay. Ali's anecdotes. Just wrong with that. <laughs> you can just talk to yourself and be more entertaining than Chris. Call it, just call it that. Yeah. Don't see this man. This, 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 this hurts me. Bad for my feelings. Bad for my. We'll back it up with some questions. What do you got? Not a lot, man. You know that. I don't have a lot. I don't have a lot. You, of you, you, you've got you've got twenty minutes left. This is going to be a one hour special. Twenty <laughs> minutes left. Special. <laughs> <laughs> a one hour special. One hour so at what point, Dan, did you jump into martial arts then? I know it's been covered on other sort of podcasts, just for anyone that's not seen those. What point did you jump across into martial arts from the basketball? Were they running at the same time or did one follow the other or how did that work for yourself? I, I, I think I got into it sort of a, as a fan when I was still playing basketball. Like I watched some MMA at that point. Um, but like you remember back then, what that was, I guess, shit, that would have been 15 years ago when I was still playing basketball. Like the internet at that point was like... Not that useful. Like, it'd be very hard to find stuff. You couldn't just go on Google and say, you know, Jiu-Jitsu Scotland or MMA Scotland. Or maybe you could, but there'd be very, very little to be found, right? So I just didn't know it was really available. I didn't know you could... Um, I didn't know there was places that were training. Um, so, like, I was into it, but I didn't know I could do it anyway. And then eventually, um, weirdly enough, I, I guess probably I, my first class uh, was through... An, Edinburgh, because I didn't know anywhere in, in, in Fife. We went through to Edinburgh to uh, Willie Scott's place. What was that called again? Alba Donna Dea. I think it's still open. Um, it was kind of a trek, you know, it was like 35 minutes, 40 minutes or whatever. And I went with one of my mates a couple of times. It, we had a great time, but it was like, this is kind of too far to travel. I wasn't driving at the time. So I tried a couple of times then. And, and, and from that point, I was kind of just... Uh, dragging some of my mates like into the into the living room like clearing out the furniture let's have a roll let's have a roll in here or in the garden with the, with the dog shit landmines all around so for for about six months to a year i was rolling kind of like you know on people's carpets or in um uh, on the grass um and then eventually uh, my mate who was going to banantine said oh they're opening an ma thing at banantines so i'm like all right fuck it, i'll go i'll sign up so i signed up to banantines just to go to this ma thing um, I go to the first class and who do I see that we that we buckle John John Humphreys is there teaching the class <laughs> um, yeah and I guess that was around 25 25 years old uh, that I first met John and first started actually training um, and I think at that point the, the classes were like maybe once a week maybe twice um, but after speaking to John he's like oh I'll train in the morning if you like and I was working like uh, super shitty shifts but like uh, John's like, I'm free at like six o'clock every morning. Like, all right, fuck it. I guess I'm training at six o'clock every morning, um, which was terrible. But at least I found someone that shared the passion that I had to train all the time. That's pretty cool. And that was John, the good brigade. Yeah, well, What's that? That's it, so that would be the original Don brigade. Eh? That's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> John, John was it was like basically you. me and John, and all they had at Valentine's for this MA class. Um, I guess it'd be about four, not four meters, maybe three meters by three meters less. Two meters by two meters max. So two by two. So me and John were sparring on two by two. So we just all the time just land on the wooden wooden floor next to it and just keep on rolling because you, we've almost got each other. So we just keep on rolling on the wooden floor. So it got slightly better because we had like four mats, but uh, <laughs> not much better. Yeah. That's um, pretty funny how John, John's been so influential in all of our um, jiu-jitsu careers, essentially. 
I mean, back then, John was an absolute... I mean, he still is a maniac. He hides it better. Uh, <laughs> he hides it better now. Um, <laughs> back, back then, um, I mean, John would take MMA fights, take, like, MMA fights as part of training, basically, because he couldn't get training in. She's like, well, I'll just take a fight. I'll learn what I'm doing, type thing. <laughs> and it's not like... It, 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 what is he, like... He, He's five seven or five eight if he's lucky, right? Yeah, something like that. And he's yeah. fighting at like I, I personally saw him fight at like you know ninety two kilos and stuff like this. He was probably like eighty five or something. He's fighting some guy who's six four, jacked. I'm like, I'm not sure this is a great idea, John. Like <laughs> that guy's twenty five years old. I'm sure John was forty seven when I met him, although he denies that. But <laughs> like he was an absolute maniac to, to like. To accept the fights that he accepted with no notice, you know, upper weight class. Oh, this guy's like national champion of this in Poland or something. Like, oh, I'll fight him, sorry. So, yeah, John was like certifiably insane. Yeah. And he said to me after about three months, I think he's hey, probably ready for a fight now. I'm like, yeah, all right. Yeah, I suppose you're my coach. Why not? Yeah, I'll give that a crack. And <laughs> so, about three months after that, I got signed for a fight. So, I fought my first MA fight after six months of training. And I was only training with one guy, really. I trained with John. Nobody else trained with myself. Very, very few. There was a few guys, you know, but like not consistently. And we didn't really have a place to train. So you know, did, we're training on four mats at Ballantines in the morning. So did like Connor and David, did they come and train with you at, what was it being like, Silverbacks or something at the time? Uh, they first started at the Grapple Chapel, I think. Would you? And then you just Best name to for a gym ever, by the way. Uh, one of my mates had this uh, this old church that like he was going to develop into into apartments, but not right away. So we got a really good deal on the rent and just put a bunch of mats there in this old like church. Um, super cool place to train. I mean, sure there was rats and you know it was freezing and <laughs> there was many things wrong with it. But it's a really cool place to train. Mm-hmm. And that, that's when that's when Connor and maybe David was after. Maybe David was at uh, Silverbacks first, but Connor came along to the grapple chapel either. Uh, I think David's training again, but I don't think Connor's not trained in a long time, apparently. No, no, I seen Connor when I was back. I popped into the shop he was working in to catch up with him. But uh, yeah, I guess he's got two kids now or something. And, yeah, yeah, not training. David's got his uh, purple. He's a purple now down at uh, Darn, uh, Darn's place. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it was, it's quite funny if we think about if we think about where we, where we started with John, just in the rugby club. Again, it was like three mats by three mats down and just rolling about in there. Quite funny because me and Ramsey were talking about this and we're saying when we started John stole his purple belt. It's like a purple belt was like so far away. Like so far away it was like he was basically a ninja. We had no idea what to do. And now you're like three years down, three and a half or nearly four years down the line. It's uh, it's, it's amazing how you don't realise how like far you progress until like a new guy comes into the gym and he's trying to <laughs> jump on you and you're like <sighs> okay, it's just, just <laughs> it's quite funny how 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 um how far you can progress and um I suppose it's not really a short piece of time, is it? Four nearly, nearly four years I've been training now. Yeah, it's true, yeah. If, sometimes it feels like a short period of time. You look it would have been it would years. have been it would have been earlier because I I'm pretty sure I messaged you I think you ju- I think you went did you go to Taiwan originally as a holiday? For like three months, yeah, so like a yeah. three-month holiday, like, whatever that's called. I, I had messaged you, but you had just went to Taiwan, and then you decided you were staying. But I was going to start training jiu-jitsu then, because I was kind of bored with boxing. I was getting bored with the whole thing. It was just constantly the same. And uh, But you had moved away, and I think you had said, go and train with Connor, but I don't think I think he was kind of stopping training or something at the time. It didn't happen. It didn't happen until John started training one morning at, um, at the rugby club. And we just went in, and then from there, it's kind of we ended up in, in Goliath. Um, but yeah, it's cool. It's cool how, how and now, now you see these facilities, and you see like Mops facility, and now Goliath's looking pretty cool. And Stevie's place, there's so many good good places to go and roll. Yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy, man. Like um, it should mean that people progress faster, right? Like when I started, it was like I said, me just me and John basically um, uh, consistently trained together. And there was no real things to to learn from. Like you got like like Eddie Bravo's rod, rubber guard book, or like. You could try and download some instruction that would take about three weeks and it came through and there was no English, it's all Portuguese, stuff like this. Now you just have, I mean, there's every jiu-jitsu thing you ever need to know on YouTube, right? All you need is an amazing bullshit detective. Mm. 
So like all the information is there. People have the facilities, have good coaches. Like I look back at them, man, these fuckers are spoiled. Yeah. See, I, I don't like, like I, I've, I've talked to Ali about this before. I don't like really watching videos of people. I don't like seminars really. I, like, I mean, I'll go to your seminar and I'll go to Mop's seminar because I think I, I, I like Mop's, Mop's coaching. But I don't really go to seminars because I, I. Man, you, you need to get off Mop's nutsack, man. You just mentioned them twice in the last two minutes. <laughs> For fuck's sake. Why do you, if you love Mop so much, why do you get him on as a guest? <laughs> Because uh, I, I can't take the piss out of him, but I can take the piss out of you. Um, but uh, yeah, I only Look, I, I love Mop too, just not as much as you do. But you wonder, you, you you wonder why I don't speak. I've sat for ten minutes, never said anything. When I open my mouth, all you do is walk. <laughs> when you opened your mouth, all you talked about was Mop. Me 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 me. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder why I don't say anything. I know. But it is true that I think you're right, Dan, though, that guys are spoiled by the facilities that are on show. Like you were saying, they're travelling, you know, 40 minutes or so out to Aberdorn there versus, you know, we've got Goliath literally, you know, two minutes down the road from where we are. You've got Stevie's place over in Kirkcaldy, you know, 10, 15 minutes away. Mop's place, just for Chris, 45 minutes away, maybe half an hour away. Um, all within a very short, you know, and then clubs over in Edinburgh as well. Um, it has become not quite ubiquitous, but it's definitely exploded over the last sort of five to seven years, I reckon, and more well, so in the last sort of three years. Well, what, so you guys don't know about the me because you guys still live there. How much do you think can be credited to like the Conor McGregor effect? Just like it became Master, like a lot. I think so because I think he, I think he became the the kind of big like crossover star that 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 UFC particularly are always looking for. You know, there's like always actual, that like an actual celebrity, right? Yeah, yeah, and even like you know, if you think about it, you know, I'm a big pro wrestling fan. You look at the Rock and the, the Stone Colds that everyone knows, even if you don't really watch wrestling. Conor McGregor slipped into that kind of MMA style, where even if you didn't watch MMA, you were aware of Conor McGregor. Mm -hmm. He appeared on the news, all as you say, Dan, almost as a a celebrity rather than a fighter. Um, and I think that had a massive element, and I, and I think a huge element of it as well, probably locally, is where, where Stevie's um, you know exposure in the UFC as That's well. True, yeah. Well, definitely yeah. felt you know a local guy. It's kind of like we were talking, we were speaking on the last podcast with Ian Mackey, the Olympic sprinter from Dunfermline, and we were saying like you know local guys that are getting to the top level can only be a positive influence on you know young guys that are coming in. You know those teenagers, 13, 14, 15 year old guys. And you can see that, well, there's a guy just there for Kirkcaldy that got into the UFC. So it's not, oh, there's those guys in yeah. There's no those guys in New York that have gone through the wrestling programs at a Division One college or have been trained. That You know, it's, it's, it's a guy from somewhere I know, somewhere I've been. And I think that plays a big element in the influence. And yeah. that's why I'm the talking guy and Chris sits, Chris sits and drinks beers, you see. It makes sense. Yeah. I mean, Stevie, uh, Stevie's very lucky. Uh, my pro debut in MMA was supposed to be against Stevie. And that would have just put the brakes on it straight away. <laughs> no UFC career for Stevie right after that. <laughs> what, uh, what, what's funny to me is, what's funny to me is watching from, so when I started boxing, and it was, every, every little village in Fife had a boxing club. Every village had a, a boxing club. They don't anymore. So I've seen, I've seen from um, from when I started boxing in two thousand eight, and, and you would you were guaranteed five or six fights a year just on home shows at clubs. They would say, "Come fight us, our guy will fight in your show," and then you have a championship, whatever. I've watched that go to. There's now very few boxing clubs, and there's now MMA clubs, Jiu Jitsu clubs everywhere. And then when we went through to a higher level, when you did a seminar through there, I was astonished at how busy it was for a, a Thai class. Uh, you're like, gee, this is busier than the boxing clubs now. So it's now like this full swing. And boxing, um, like amateur boxing is kind of just, still doesn't really acknowledge that this is a problem. And they still won't, you know, accept what their problems are. And they just kind of go, nah, we're just going to get blinkers on and ignore this stuff. And meanwhile, everything's grown round about it. And it will eventually take, because now, like you're saying, it's in terms of locally, uh, you know, 10 years ago, there was um, a few good pro guys in Scotland. Now those the good pros are Stevie Ray, um, and and you know there's a lot of guys from higher level that are doing really well, uh, like Callum Murray just won in Bellator, a good win. 
Um, so the local guys. I think it's a good I, point, but I, I have to ask one thing, Chris. Yes. How does Mop fit into all this? <laughs> well, he trains at a higher level, and he perfect. Good, good. good. As long as there's a connection, good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think, when I think, was the last thing you were punched really hard in the mouth? Uh, it's been a while, man. It's been a while, to be honest. No. I've deserved uh, when, when, are you, when are you neg back? Uh, yeah. As soon as I am, I'll let you know you can give me a good crack. Um, I, I do think the, uh, the amateur boxing thing, you could compare it to like uh, judo and, uh, and amateur uh, wrestling. I think you have to embrace the fact that MMA is huge and say, look, this is a good way to get better at MMA. So, like, more people would go to boxing if it was accessible and also that they would, like, I want to be an MA fighter. And they're not just rubbish that. I say, oh, we can help you with your hands. The same yeah. way judo should embrace it and say, hey, judo's a great take on our good submissions. You can do this for MA too. And not, like, try and throw the MA thing out. I think it's a bit silly to try and preserve the, like, the, 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 um, the purity of the sport, if you like. You see yeah. a different way. MMA is very big. So use that as a sort of catalyst to make, it, make the sport bigger again. They still, they still just completely dismiss it in boxing. They still just dismiss. I, I know so a guy that we're going to hopefully have on next week, a friend of mine, Kieran Smith, is a really good undefeated pro boxer. Um, he trains at high level sometimes, so he's kind of getting. He, you know, he kind of is around it, so he he probably have a better idea of of kind of why they don't kind of fit each other. But generally, they just dismiss it, like I did five years ago. But yeah, okay. I feel, I feel like the decision makers in boxing and in judo are kind of like an older generation, just a, a, yeah. a bunch of old guys making decisions in boxing. And, you know, they see, they see the shitty stand-up in MMA as being like a shitty stand-up rather than realizing there's a reason why it's that way. Yeah, yeah. And they have to protect against different things, different weapons are there, but it's hard to see. And you would have thought the same thing when you first started watching MMA. That's oh, these guys striking a shank. Really bad. Boxing. And like, yeah. yeah I've still but got like, I still got friends who do that. They watch a, a UFC fight. Um, I can't even think of anything off, off my head. It's like really a really good stand-up fight, and they go, "This is just bad boxing." You go, "Yeah, but they're doing that. They can't stand the way a boxer stands because they will just get their inside leg chewed up mm. or get shot on, or you know what I mean." They still don't understand. They just don't want to understand it because they like to think we are the combat sport. Um, probably like judo does, like you're saying, in terms of grappling. Yeah. Um, they, they still think they are the thing, and Jiu Jitsu is just kind of these noisy youths that are, are, are just annoying us. I mean, I'm, they, sure, I'm sure they had Judo France a few years back banned all their black belts from teaching in MMA clubs well, to I mean, play judo, and protect the purity. Well, Judo France is where the head of the Judo Association is. Yeah. You think it'd be in oh. Japan, but no, the head is actually in, 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 in France. So, right. And they make the decision for all the uh, all Judo. And yeah, you can't like compete at a national level. I think anywhere if you're a pro MMA fighter and stuff like that, they've really mm. made it. You can't compete in Jiu Jitsu or MMA if you're a, a, a national level judo player. So I, I know um, when me, me and my friend Danny, who was my coach when I boxed, we went down to, to talk to the guy who runs the boxing club and just down the road from me and carved them because he was thinking about retiring and all this kind of stuff. So we went down to them, we kind of had our own plans, like what, how you should train, because they still train very much old school, skip for half an hour and then do some sparring and then, and then hit the bag and then do it. So we you kind of had our own idea and it was like, you know, we'd like to take guys sparring different places. No, no, you can't do that. You're not allowed to go sparring with anybody else. You spar in the club and that's it. And you're going, how do you even, how do you even start? So you just kind of went, you know what, forget it. And then that's when they just kind of went, this is, it's a waste of time trying to be involved in this sport because they just don't want to, Acknowledge anything that they could possibly be a little bit in the in the, the dark ages. I mean, there's jujitsu gyms like that still. You know, that's that's not uncommon to say you can't spar anywhere else. Is it? I've never heard yeah, that, that's that's not uncommon. It, it basically comes from coaches with like uh, with a big ego and are scared to see their students see something else. Mm. You know, what I mean, they're scared that they see something else and prefer. It. So it comes from like a place of like a lack of confidence, I suppose. Yeah, I suppose that makes sense. That makes sense. If, yeah. if all your students go somewhere else to spar and they all get their ass kicked, they just get smoked. They'd be like, why are we training at this place? This place is obviously better. It happens. It happens quite a lot, I suppose. Um, yeah. yeah. It's quite sad, but yeah, I don't, I don't really care about boxing anymore. I don't really care about <laughs> grappling now. Don't really care about that shit. I just want to care about grappling. I mean, look, look at the way you're piling back those beers. I don't think you care about much anymore. No, I don't. You have that effect on me, to be honest. 
<laughs> you have that effect on me. Um, but yeah, so what? What's? Um, have you got any? Are you? Are you got plans to compete again? Are you want to do some some more competitions? I, I certainly, I certainly want to. When I got to China, I was like, it's kind of the perfect storm. Like, you, you know, in life, um, for many people, it's like either you have time or you have money. You have to make a choice, right? So if you work a lot, oh, you've got money, but you've got no fucking time. China was like the perfect balance for me. So like, I didn't have to work that much, but I had plenty of money. So it's like the, the sort of perfect balance where I have time to train, I have time to go away and compete. Where Taiwan was like, it's kind of like trying to find that balance of just not really enough, not really enough money or not really enough time, like all together in Taiwan. But in China, I had time and money. So I got plenty of time for training and plenty, plenty of money to get away to, to compete and stuff. So that was the plan. But obviously, that's... Um, sorted out when, when the world fixes itself I suppose. We need to um, at some point we need to uh, they're doing quite a lot of like, quintet events now in Scotland uh, so there's quintet events on quite regular, not quite regularly but they have been on. So we need to try and coordinate a time for you to be back when we can have our own have you Yeah, so it's a fun format that I, I, like, I yeah. like the way that's set up. If we could have a, like a Goliath quintet team and uh, have you and have you and our team would be pretty cool. Yeah I'd be down for that for sure. Uh, that'd be cool. Uh, so hopefully, hope, the good thing I was, I, was, I was going to say earlier on, I think before you were taking the piss of me, was um, uh, because of everything else I was going to do this year is, is cancelled. I can now, once we get training again, I can now spend the next, like the rest of the year just doing jiu-jitsu, which I'm quite looking forward to, forgetting about everything else and just doing jiu-jitsu, which will be quite fun. But maybe we get to spend the second half of the year training, you know, six or seven times a week um, at Goliath. Hopefully that'll yeah, be so all, all your events and stuff are cancelled, eh? All your Everything weird running happens. shit and cycling and swimming yeah. and all that mental the, shit you do. The only thing that isn't cancelled yet is um, the Iceland camp. That's all that's not cancelled. But I, I think that'll get cancelled. I don't see that happening. But um, So, yeah, I, it, it, we'll just get to concentrate purely on jiu-jitsu for six months, which is... And I, and I know that, you know, before Naga last year, when I kind of knuckled down for eight, ten weeks, and like Ramsey and a few guys said... Um, like there was a difference when I just trained jiu-jitsu instead of training, you know, some swimming and some cycling. There was a huge difference. Well, who would have thought? Who would have thought? Yeah, if you focus on something, you get better at it. So, we'll that adds up. That. Hopefully, get. I mean, look at Mop. He, he really focuses on what he does. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> hear you. Good. Now, <laughs> oh, hey, what you got? Give me some fucking. Give me some sense. <laughs> some sense. Now, you know, I think it's a, it makes sense, you know, and it's, it is a great point you make if you do focus on something. And I think you were right when you were talking earlier, Dan, that when everything reopens, you're going to see that January rush times, you know, whatever factor you want to put on it, because it's not just been the couple of days after Christmas. Some of us haven't trained for, I know for yourself, you know, you're talking several months since your lockdown started for us, it's going to be heading on towards probably eight weeks, ten weeks maybe, before the gyms all fully open up, I reckon, again, putting a figure on it. So it's going to be, it'll be good to get back on the mats, it'll be good to get back training. I think we'll have to start with probably two-minute rounds because we're all going to be dying by the time it hits 90 seconds. Well, I think um, everyone but, will be in shit shape, so it'll kind of even itself out, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm hoping so, I'm hoping so. Except for Owen charging up Town Hill Road, him <laughs> looking like he's robbed the shop. I don't know if you saw that on Harris's Insta. And, <laughs> yeah, I think I did, yeah. But, uh, yeah, everyone's just, I think it's one of those things you start off going like, oh, yeah, we get an hour, we'll, we'll try and keep on top of things. And as you say, it just becomes easier to sit back and not do something when you've not got as much focus, you know, when you've not got the gym to go for, you know, you're not going to be training three times a week. It's yeah, easier to do something, you, you know, you get like, a, You watch one arm wrestling video, then 10 hours later, you realize you've, you're heavily invested in arm wrestling now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You fall, you fall into weird little, little rabbit holes, don't you? And you just, you know, find yourself down there and watching stuff. And uh, I would highly recommend watching some arm wrestling. Okay, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll go on that. So we can talk I've about seen, it. On I've the seen a couple. I've seen a couple of Russian guys arm wrestling. Like the guy who's massive, um, and he knocks him out. He's, he's, um, he's, you know, this is the guy that does all the slaps. I've seen him arm oh, wrestling. No. Black championship. Right. Know, the guy slaps everybody. I've seen him arm wrestling. He's, he's outrageous. How strong he is. Those Russian guys are different reasons. No uh, no you don't know anything about arm wrestling, so shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bow down to your superior knowledge on that point. 
I, but I have no one to arm wrestle, so I'm just basically like, just just studying mostly. No sparring for me, just studying. Okay, okay then we'll get over. We can set up in Goliath. We've got a table set up. We can arm wrestle each other. That would definitely bring me back quicker, for sure. I'll we'll go for it. Whatever it was called, the overhand scoop or whatever you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I reckon I'm going to be shit at it, but like, I, I, I'm into giving it a try. If, if nothing else, you could do like the you could do the ESPN analyst on the sidelines. You can That's talk a good about, idea, yeah. You know what I mean? Like you could get Chris and Owen arm wrestling. You can you can talk it through. I can be the color man giving a bit of hype and good God Almighty, that man's got a family. His own. <laughs> Chris's arm apart or something. Why is just pick, just pick on Chris today? What the fuck? I, I honestly thought that was every day, but I realised every day I see you, I'm also there. Yes, beautiful. So I never see you without me, right? I'm always here, so someone's always mocking you and it's always me. Yeah, it's you. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't happen in your everyday life? No. No, it's only you. It's only you that picks on me. That's weird. Why don't I do that? Yeah. Kind of a bully, actually. I mean, if that makes you feel good about yourself, then that's fine. But, you know, I mean... It's... I mean, that's exactly what bullying is for. <laughs> <laughs> if, it has, if it has one purpose, that's it. It makes you feel good about yourself. Yeah. I mean, it says more about you than it does me, but it's cool. It's cool, man, if that's what gets you up in, if that's what gets you up in the morning, yeah, it's fine. I know what gets you up in the morning. Two beers, by the looks of things. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday, I'm not working. I want to do some gardening, I've told you this. Um, Our tools and beer, perfect combination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nothing good go wrong. What could go wrong? We <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, We've hit the hour mark, Dan. You good to keep going, or is that your time? Up? Um, I could do a bit longer. Was it? Yeah. If you if you give me some good questions, uh, I'll, I'll give it until um, I'll give it until half past for good okay. for good questions. If there, if there's if there's a, any five second uh, breaks or boredom, I'm just going to hang up. <laughs> so just before that kicks in if you do if anyone's wanting to follow we always do this on the shout outs for guests anyone want to follow on your social media what's your social media shout outs what's your handle what's your usernames to let people follow you uh, Instagram is just Dan there we go nice and simple that's nice and simple. I don't want anyone adding my fucking Facebook that's annoying man why do you add your Facebook like people you don't know I think that's weird yeah. uh, it is a bit I, weird I, yeah, I, 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 I usually bit. accept that we've got mutual friends but like Feel weird about it. Like, why, why does this person want to add me as a friend? Maybe it's because they like you. It's hard to believe. Yeah, I, I don't know. Because then I just see their stuff on, on my wall and I've got to just start like hiding all their stuff. Yeah, that's I, I mean, I hid you a long time ago, Chris. I never see your stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's cool. Yeah. That's fine. I, I, actually, to be honest, I have maybe, maybe 10 people that are still like, I haven't hidden their stuff from my Facebook. Yeah. So my Facebook's uh, super boring. When are you? Uh, when are you getting my rash guard made? That's the most important question. Uh, I mean, everywhere's closed down, man. Like. No, I asked you. <laughs> as soon as prices <laughs> open up, I guess. You keep asking me for a timeline. Uh, uh, the only time in history where I can like, no one can give a timeline right now. Nothing yeah. is like. I never, I never once asked you for a timeline. I asked you when you were getting it made. You haven't designed it yet. You haven't done. You haven't done the drawing thing yet. I'm doing it. You're doing it. Well, that was, there was a question mark in it. Maybe we'll talk about this uh, via messenger. I don't know if like, anyone's interested in uh, yeah, you know, domestic disputes. It's the only way I can get you to, to commit to anything is by public pressure. Uh, yes, I'll do whatever it is you're asking for. <laughs> well, uh, just, just, basketball just, question then, Dan. Who was your Who was your basketball hero growing up then? Just to take it off there. Like the uh, like professional players or like local guys? Either. Um, I mean, I mean, local. I, I played for, for uh, the firm and Rain from about twelve years old, thirteen years old. So, like at that time, they had like uh, the eighteen champions, twenty three champions. Um, so they had a bunch of good guys, and of course, like a little bit later, guys like Robert Ashball were like, you know, starting to play in uh, Illinois and all this stuff. Um, so, like, it was good to, like we said earlier about Stevie Ray. Seeing, uh, I think James Steele went to play for the Rocks. Uh, Robert Archibald went to play, uh, obviously overseas and professionally. I was thinking, like, oh, this is actually possible for like people from this small place to, to go somewhere. 
wasn't possible for me, but it is possible for people. <laughs> so guys, that would be people that, uh, when I was younger, that, that I suppose I looked up to it in, in, in that way. Um, yeah, again, it's just seeing that people from your your place, your domain can go ahead and, and, and do it at a bigger level. Yeah, and I think that is a, a great thing, even for, for people like, you know, yourself, again, coming from a local area and then, you know, travelling the world and training jiu-jitsu, uh, interesting people and, and coming back every so often. It must be inspiring for even, you know, the young guys at Goliath. Obviously, I'm at the other end of the market. I'm not going to be travelling anywhere with wife and kids apart from holidays. But for young guys... Well, sometimes they might divorces home. happen. <laughs> I uh, probably really relates more to Sandra. She's placed, when she watches this, she might, yeah, you're right, divorces can happen. <laughs> Being stuck in the house together, working from home. Um, She'll, she'll probably agree with you on that sentiment 100%. In fact, she'll probably comment below <laughs> like the, the influencers do. Comment below, guys. She'll be commenting below, like, yeah, we'll, we'll be getting divorced, don't worry about that. But well, yeah, it must, be, it must be inspiring. Yeah, inspiring uh, for the young guy. To be honest, it's weird, right? So, uh, I mean, a lot of years ago, um, how old was that? Maybe 20, 21, 22, something like that. I, um, I, I my, my girlfriend was from Singapore and she was in the UK for a couple of years, then she left and went back. Oh, she'd come and she'd come and live here. And I was thinking, like, how could I live in Asia? Like, that'd be impossible. Like, in my mind, I don't know why. I just thought, I could never do that. It'd be impossible to do. I thought it'd be really difficult. But then after coming and, and, and sort of, like, just uh, as a vacation, rather than thinking about coming to, uh, to move, I realized how easy it would be and how many absolute idiots already do it. Like, so many expats are idiots. Like, they're not smart people. They're idiots. And I thought, I'm an idiot, I could do this. So like, I think people think it's harder than it is. Like, is, there, um, is there anywhere else on, on your list to go and, and work, train, or, or just live for a while? Or? Um, yeah, I really don't know, man. I, I, I honestly didn't really see myself leaving ta Taiwan, but then like some opportunities came up. Um, and like after visiting China and seeing... Um, like, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I didn't actually have high expectations for China. Because the places I've been before were like very crowded and busy. But the, the cities I visited were like super nice. People were friendly. I liked like I liked a, a lot of things about it and and a lot of natural beauty that I just wouldn't associate straight away with, with China. Have you never fancied Oh yeah, I can see you I can see you on your keyboard, mate. This is so unprofessional. On my keyboard? No, I'm on my note. It's an, it's an old school notebook. All right, okay, okay. All right. I'll, I'll let it I'll, 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 I was about to hang up there. Have you never fancied Australia or anything? What's that, mate? Have you never fancied Australia or anything like that to train for a while? Not really. Um, I, I can't even tell you why. But, um, I, just don't really. like, I don't like the idea of Australia because I've got family there. I just don't like the idea of like, crocodiles and snakes and spiders. That's the, that's the only I think, reason. I think the reason that uh, I, I never think about Australia is because coming from Scotland, I think Australia, that's a million miles away. It'll take three days to get there, like in my in my stupid brain. In Taiwan, it's like a six or seven hour flight to Melbourne, like it's close. But in my head still, I think that's miles away. I could never get there, it'll take forever. So something in my head still thinks Australia is a million miles away. Yeah. So I never look at it as a possibility. Yeah. What about, you never fancy go back to Texas to train or? I was back not a long ago. Oh, were you? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, my, my cousin who, uh, uh, he came to visit me in Taiwan maybe, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, something like that. And he started training jiu-jitsu and he's, he's came back like once a year or so. And uh, now he's park belt training at a good gym out there. So uh, I train with his team a whole bunch, some good guys. That's cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. Uh, yeah, training is good at there, man, but there's some big fucking guys. Holy shit. Like the sort yeah. of like slogan for Texas is everything's bigger in Texas. Yeah. No fucking jokes, man. There's one of some guys were fucking massive. That's one of the hardships of, of, of Scotland. Is there isn't really any even remotely big people. There's not many people who are over like six foot and 180 pounds. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's not a lot of people like that. Um, I, see, I, I guess my mind is different. Coming from Asia, like there are some big guys, but like majority would be uh, smaller overall, like height and weight, uh, than guys in the UK. So when I come out of this Scotland, I'm like, fucking hell, guys are pretty big here. The average guy's a bit bigger. Than the states or in Texas, like the average guy is a bit bigger again. I don't know if you ever noticed when you're like in, when you're like at Naga or something. When we were in Amsterdam, um, some of the Polish oh, guys. Oh, Naga and Mop. If it's not Mop, it's Naga. First Naga, then Mop, then Mop, then Naga. Go on. Some of the Russian guys and some of the Polish guys are 
absolutely enormous, like ridiculously yeah. sick, like sexy and 260 pounds. Like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> but absolute monsters. Uh, it makes the jujitsu really interesting, man. Things, things are different. Yeah, it's some uh, big uh, linebacker guy who's training at my cousin's gym. He must be 300 pounds, but he's not, he's not fat at all, you know. Like, he was like blasting at hundreds of push ups after class and stuff. He's a brown belt, too, so I'm like, fuck's sake, all right, here we go. And it's just, a, like, it's a nightmare, like, like, unbreakable grip, just, like, unmovable object. It's like, all right, this is going to be a test, man. Who was, the, like it, who was the, the Greek wrestler guy that you were rolling with? It was a purple belt. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, my, it's my mate Sam's gym in Greece. He's, he's, he's got a nice gym in Athens, but I think he, I guess he just got his purple belt that day or something like that. I don't know how heavy he was. He was probably 130 or 140 kilos. And again, not not fat, but also like national Greco champion of Greece. And just like I swear, I swear, I swept this guy around his back, and he just like spun out right back to his knees again, like fast as a cat at 140 kilos. I'm like, all right, well, okay, <laughs> I'm not going to sweep you. How are you going to tap this guy? He's like so massive, like amazing posture from wrestling all these years, yeah. and he knows enough jujitsu, right? He's, he's already part of that level. And, oh man, yeah, not fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right, I've uh, I'm just about out of things to say. I don't know You're wasted, mate. I'm not wasted <laughs> the slightest. I'm just about out of things to say. There's yeah, only I'm so many things to talk about. So I it, boys. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for taking the piss at me for an hour and a bit. That was pleasant. And he's dropped off. That was Dan Reed leaving the, the podcast there. <laughs> he just disappeared. He just dropped off. Good old oh, man. man. But no, it was good though, man. It was a good wee chat. Um, you got a wee bit tick off him, but yeah. fuck you, didn't you? <laughs> exactly you did, exactly I'll just stop the recording, but that was episode five. Uh, was, um, yeah. Other ones coming through. <laughs>